All right, guys, I guess we'll go ahead and begin here. Um, central doctrines, uh, continue our series of lessons on these studies that are things that, uh, well, are essential, right? Um, I guess before we begin, we'll, we'll stop for a prayer and then we'll put you on the spot. But if you're getting here, please help prepare for service. Our God, as we come to you this morning, we just want to thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. We're just grateful for the blessing of life and the love and care that you have for us. We're especially thankful that on this day, at this time, we have this iron which we can come together and study your word. We ask, Father, that you be with Jonathan as he directs our thoughts today and our study. And be with all the other teachers here this morning, Father. <coughs> Help us as students of our word to listen carefully and to take the things as presented to us that we may study upon them, Father, with the effort to serve you better. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, so start by uh, going over our lesson objectives for this lesson, lesson two, part two. Um, that's causing some confusion with paper copies and such. Hope everybody's got carry with everything that they need on those, but I guess get with me after class if you're missing stuff. Lesson objectives for this particular lesson list some of God's invisible attributes as revealed by his creation. Briefly summarize what's called the teleological argument. I hope I'm pronouncing that word correctly because that's how I pronounce it from this point forward. Teleological. Uh, describe the idea of cosmic fine tuning. Explain how mankind, as God's creator, are without excuse according to God's divine judgment. I guess that's all of those. I really like these foundational assumptions, so I'll throw these up here once again. Uh, hopefully, things that we agree upon going into the study and, and going forward. The Bible is the inspired, is inspired, and is the source of truth. God has revealed all we need to know in the Bible. What one believes matters to be acceptable to God. Some doctrines are essential to what we're studying in this class and are the basis for unity, which is our goal in, in this series of studies, is having unity in these things. It's possible to determine the truth on essential doctrines, if we're based on Scripture. What one believes will be expressed in behavior. We talked about those fruits of the Spirit and the idea that uh, the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaks, uh, Jesus would say, and other, other verses like that. <coughs> And finally, number seven, we may disagree on unessential things, and some things cannot be known. So some things we just have to throw our hands up in the air and like, we're not sure. But we did mention in our introduction, and it's still beneficial to study those things, of course. So, uh, again, all these foundational assumptions, I think, are going to be important to uh, all of our studies that we'll go through and, and uh, go through together. So, uh, this particular lesson, the nature of God as revealed by creation. Um, if you got the material in advance... Um, I told you to kind of meditate upon this verse right here in particular, Romans 1.20, which says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. And so a discussion question. I've got a series of images I want to pop up here on the screen. And I'm just curious to see what you all think as we view these images here. What characteristics of God come to mind as you observe the natural world? So right here we got the, I guess it's the Grand Canyon here. Any, any thoughts spring to mind, viewing something as awe-inspiring as, as this view here? All you can look at is awesome. That stone there, God, yeah. and awesome God. That's all you can there you go, yeah. Awesome. All right, here's another one. Think about the, the ocean. I'm trying to find a good image of the, the vast scope of it, and I found this instead. So I thought it was pretty cool. Spent mm -hmm. a lot of time on, on the, the Google image. Uh, search. <laughs> <laughs> any, any thoughts of the ocean? Power. Power, yeah, those waves constantly doing their thing. All right, I don't know what mountain this is, so if anybody knows, that'd be, that'd be great, but I thought it was a cool picture of the mountain here with the wonderful reflection there in the water. Any thoughts? Spring to mind. Characters of God revealed by his creation. What's going on now? Majestic. Beautiful. Oh, that's a lot. Beautiful. All right, this is a cool image. So we've got a cactus in the foreground, but what I really was focused on was the rainbow and the lightning. I thought it was kind of interesting thing there. Any thoughts for this one? Power and forgiveness. Yeah, power and forgiveness. I think about the you know the promise God has, his mercy, and you think about the lightning, you know, we also know that he's capable of destruction in some cases as well. So he's he's got both those those things going on, right? Both those characteristics. All right, going to a very small scale. Here we got a little tiny uh, individual snowflake. What do you think with this image? Unique, complex. Ooh, unique, complex, yeah. Uh, is is every snowflake supposed to be a unique Creation, right? No, no two are exactly the same, right? So that's pretty interesting. All right, what about wildlife, like this eagle here? I jumped to balance. Balance? Ooh, yeah. What, what I thought of it, yeah. yeah. Ecosystem. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. so there's an eagle itself. Like, oh, I get that. 
Is there, yeah, <laughs> I guess that's important, right? Aerodynamics. Yeah, yeah you know? I, I see that, yeah. Okay. And then uh, what about what about these? Oh. Uh, <laughs> 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 Someone must need to update our interviews. <laughs> Yeah. Any thoughts on mankind or you know the church? You did that on purpose. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts? Well, it's made in the body of your Christ. Yeah, but you know, in his image, right? Good, good thoughts. All right. So going back to this verse, Romans one twenty, for his invisible attributes, namely his internal power and divine nature, <clears throat> and clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they're without excuse. And I've underlined a couple of uh, key phrases here. These are things I kind of want to focus on in this lesson. I kind of use this as the, um, I guess, the framework for what we're going to talk about going forward. And some of these things we'll get to in greater detail than others. I'll be honest, I got really carried away talking about some of the apologetics kind of stuff. So <coughs> I hope to eventually get to some of those <coughs> that God has as we go through this. Uh, if not, we, we kind of talk about the picture, so we got to tag along the words at least there along the way in the introduction. So hopefully we'll get to some of those uh, divine attributes that he would have here, the visible attributes that are revealed by creation here. All right, so starting out, um, believing in the unseen is something I want to talk about because we think of these uh, skeptics would be out there, and they would make this argument that if something can't be seen, then it must not exist. And we're familiar with the phrase, seen is believing. Of course, that would be generally good uh, reasoning. I think we all abide by that in our day-to-day -day lives as we encounter reality and interact with those things that are in the tangible world, the mostly tangible world that's around us. Um, but in one of the discussion questions I want to bring up, is there anything unseen in the universe that is known to exist despite being invisible? This is one of the discussion questions on our homework, the quote-unquote there, but if you got any off the top of your head, that's great as well. The atom? The atom, yeah. Can't see it, but it's everywhere, right? Yeah, everything's made of Right. Gravity. Oh, gravity. <laughs> gravity. Okay. There you go. Anybody else? Wind. Wind. You can like energy, time, force. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah. These are things that the very first verse of the Bible defies the fact of nature. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I wish. I wish I thought of those. That's awesome. Yeah. Those are those are really good ones. Mm -hmm. So, oh, oxygen. Yeah. That's a good one. That's kind of necessary for survival, right? Any others? So the cell. The cell. Very, very tiny. You can't see it without a microscope, right? All right, so here's some ones I, I came up with, and some of these are going to sound very familiar with what you guys came up with. Some unseen things that are known to exist. Uh, air was mentioned, or oxygen, at least part of that. Some mixture of gases. Particles are so far spread apart, you just can't see it, right? And again, it's known to exist because of all the evidence we have. Wind was mentioned. Uh, air can be captured in a balloon. Of course, you can't see it, but there's something inside this balloon that's giving it the tension and those kind of things. Uh, you know, oxygen we breathe, and so on and so forth, all those things, thank goodness if it's there, right? Or thank God it's there, right? Uh, going on, gravity was mentioned. This is a force that acts on objects throughout the universe. This is something that's fundamental for our understanding of the universe. Uh, we can't see it, and yet we know, encounter it on a daily basis, there's something that's causing... Did you like that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do that sometimes, sometimes, gravity, sometimes I don't, don't catch it, so... Uh, we encounter it on a daily basis, right? Everything we do, again, foundational to understanding things that are far beyond the scope of planet Earth even, so it's close to home yet far away also. Atoms were mentioned, uh, thank you for that one. The smallest unit of matter are particles that make up everything. And this one, I, I kind of got thinking on this one about this idea of indirect evidence. Uh, they can't be seen, but there is indirect evidence uh, that points to their existence. Uh, scientists collect data on atoms based on other uh, particles and the effects they have on those particles that are known to exist. So this is a question I want to bring up, was what role does indirect evidence play in perceiving what is unseen? You can't see atoms, you can't see gravity, you can't see air. How do we know they're there? See the effects of them. See the effects of them? Experience. Experience them. Any other thoughts? Well, when it comes to atoms, uh, you know, you're collecting information through what's called indirect evidence, once again. Uh, think about putting a puzzle together, and as you have that puzzle, I think we've all encountered the frustrating situation where we lose pieces, right? Even though those pieces are missing, we can make some inferences as to what's going on in this, in this entire image based on what we do have available in those cases, right? So dark matter is one that is kind of out there. That would be another one that would be revealed by indirect evidence, I believe. Uh, again, based on what scientists know about, again, gravity and all these different things that are going on in the physics world. 
there has to be some kind of matter that we can't see that exists in the universe. Um, we talk about the uh, center of the earth, right? And we have all this information about it. No one ever sees it, right? We're never going to see it in our lifetime. If we did, we'd be dead, I guess, right? But based on seismological evidence and those kind of things, they know that it has to exist and it has to be a particular composition and those kind of things based on evidence they can gather from things that we can see. And so I'm making a point on that one. It's essentially as if we're never going to see, again, that center of the earth there in this case. But again, all these things here through indirect evidence, we know that they, uh, they do exist because of that indirect evidence as we see here. Uh, continuing on, love, kind of out there, I guess, but I think we'd all agree that this is something that exists. Mm -hmm. Even uh, a scientist that believes only in the tangible things would probably admit that love is something that exists. Metaphysically, you know, it's something beyond the physical realm. This feeling of attraction, affection, uh, despite a bias, they might have it against the supernatural. Again, scientists acknowledge the existence of love. Um, I think we do have, of course, the uh, brain chemicals and that component of it. Um, that, that can be kind of quantified, but beyond that, um, it's through personal experience that we have these uh, this evidence for love. Any, any thoughts on that last one before we go on? That one's kind of a weird one, but I, I thought that was important to acknowledge. Uh, Jonathan, uh, <clears throat> not necessarily on that last one, but the the points you make up about, about the puzzle. Uh, there's a, a phrase that's when you start digging into apologetics, when you start looking at especially things that are seem like are they're sometimes viewed as gaps. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, phrases, you know, evidence, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Nobody, nobody starts putting that puzzle together and then that finds where the piece is missing and just comes to, to the assumption that piece never existed. Yeah. Or it doesn't exist. Yes. Right now it's underneath the couch or it's yeah. in, a, in a bin or the vacuum. Gun, it exists somewhere. But it exists somewhere. Yeah. And, and I think that's an important thing as we, as we wrap our minds in Go down this this route of uh, I want to know more about God, even seeing what I can see. In God, is recognizing if we maybe we expect to see, like if God is real, we should see Him here. If we don't. That's that's what atheists will sometimes lean on and say. Then that's evidence that He doesn't exist. Not necessarily. If we're going to be unbiased, we need to examine all the the yeah. reasons why that may not be true. It's kind of weird to talk about uh, that, that last point, the idea of having a bias against the supernatural. That there are forces that we, there's things we just can't explain. And so, I don't know, I think it's something worth, worth talking about. All right, continuing on. Um, oh, one final point on this slide. Faith is the existence of, uh, faith in the existence of the unseen. It's not unreasonable. It's the point I'm trying to make with this particular slide. There are things that we can't see uh, that through indirect evidence and in personal experience that we know they exist. And, and again, science would acknowledge that in many cases. Uh, so talk about these invisible attributes. Creation itself is evidence for a creator. And this is something that's called the teleological argument, which, again, if you had uh, the page ahead of time, maybe you did some Googling on that and you got some exposure to that. But it's kind of summed up in the idea of the appearance of design implies the existence of a designer. Uh, and, of course, in Psalm 19.1, we have the, the, the famous verse here, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So, again, Creation itself. We look at creation, and that is something that uh, to a designer, a creator, a creative force that exists that's beyond, uh, as Roger was saying, time, beyond matter, uh, outside of those things, and has the ability to, to do uh, what we see around us. Any thoughts before we continue on? You know, the one thing, Jonathan, we can look at all these things as evidence of an intelligence. So, where did the intelligence come from? Who created it? But oh, it yeah. points even further that for an intelligence that awesome to not only create, but then put all this stuff in motion that, that follows a unbelievably accurate regime. It perpetuates. It keeps going. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so when did this intel? I mean, it points to the eternalness, the always was aspect of that intelligence. It's not that well, there was an intelligence prior to the creation that started on, no, the intelligence never had a start. Yeah. This all even points to that. And we've talked about even in the animals, uh, the, just the paths of the sea that we mentioned, the, the air currents. Who orchestrated that, that it works with such precision that we can map, I mean, humans can map 
and predict eclipses, yeah. weather. Well, there, that, that's because there was order to what was brought into existence. Absolutely. So, all this, these are indirect things that that are evidence, not just of, well, there was a great, there was intelligence behind it. There was eternal intelligence. You know, that, that's existed before you existed. Not just, yeah. Not limit that, that there was intelligence, but that it started prior to the creation. So eternity has no bounds. Yeah. It's amazing. Because keep you up at night kind of stuff, right? Thinking about it. Uh, had, a, had a quote here, didn't make it to the, the slideshow. Uh, a little bit further on this theological argument. It says, it looks beyond the mere existence of the cosmos and extends the scope of inquiry to the apparent design of the universe to demonstrate there is an intelligent designer who is behind the universe and the intelligent designer points to the existence of God. And it's from the article, Classical Arguments for the Existence of God by Eddie, uh, if you want to mispronounce his last name, Wani, I believe, if I've pronounced it there. Uh, continuing on, uh, so going back to that theological argument and, and how he presents this to maybe someone else that may be unfamiliar with that, uh, this is a thought exercise that was presented by William Haley, if I say his name correctly, lots of names I'm in trouble with uh, in this presentation. Uh, imagine walking a desolate wilderness and stumbling upon a pocket watch, and you encounter this pocket watch here. This pocket watch existence necessitates the existence of a watchmaker. You know, this didn't just pop into existence, there was somebody behind it that uh, had the intelligence to, to to build it, to make it, and then you may even open it up and, and break it apart. And opening that pocket watch reveals this intricate system of gears and other various parts working in harmony toward a specific purpose here. So, quick discussion question. Uh, I can't remember if I had this one on your on your uh, handout or not. What do the complex inner workings reveal about, I guess, the nature of the watchmaker? What does this what does this indicate here? Having all these gears that are moving in synchronous motion. And, Accomplishing a, a specific purpose, what does this reveal about the watchmaker? Intelligence. He has a, he has a plan of putting all these things together and all working. Yeah, and it works. Yeah, it yeah. works. Um, so taking it further, what are the implications of this analogy in relation to the nature of God? Could those same things about the watchmaker be said about God? Would you think? Well, when you when you look into God's creation, you see. Complexities that are far greater than even the watch that we're looking at there, uh, but those complexities work uh, when they when they work <coughs> without mutation, when they work without disease or degradation. They work for the good of of, of the entity. The, yeah. the grass grass is incredibly complex, and and it it will turn its blades throughout the day to follow the sun and take it nourishment. So it's not just that uh, you know, the creator of grass must be very complex and intelligent, supreme. They designed it, and what it needs to survive needs to indicate that it prepares for it. It just keeps on going, doesn't it? So thinking about the watch once again, the inner workings of the watch. Consider how much more complex the so-called simple cell we learned in school about is going to be by comparison. All the different parts that are inside the simple cell, as Kyle said. Um, you know, we can create circuit boards and uh, you know combustion engines and those kind of things. Pale in comparison to the biological inner workings of cells and things like that. A uh, singular cell, consider it's often called the building block of life, is actually incredibly complex. You can see a whole bunch of different parts labeled here in this uh, this diagram. A uh, cell has a plethora of various parts, all called organelles, that perform a specific function. Um, you know, going beyond the cellular level, you know, it's going to work to make up the organs, the organs are going to work in organ systems, and they all work together for uh, you know, various purposes to, to again, perpetuate life within the organism that exists. Uh, <coughs> Michael Denton, I pronounced that name, a biochemist and author of The Miracle of the Cell, in terms of compressed complexity, cells are without peer in the material world. And consider, you know, that the average human body, just looking at humans in general here, 30 trillion cells. And they each have their own identity and purpose working toward uh, the survival of the organism within that. So, again, just amazingly complex, even down to the cellular level, uh, just looking at the human body here in this case. Here's another thought exercise that you might be familiar with. Um, imagine a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and somehow creating a fully functioning 747 in the aftermath of its, its path there along the way. 
We got some giggles there along the way. You know, obviously that doesn't make any kind of rational sense. Um, if you think about that, you, you can't just you know, go back to the puzzle. You, know, you don't throw the puzzle in the air and the puzzle puts itself together, uh, so to speak. There, we know that order doesn't come from chaos. Uh, to suggest the elements of our universe that came together on their own by mere happenstance. That requires a great deal of faith. You know, we're going to talk about the interplay of faith and, and lack of faith and those kind of things. We kind of touched upon that a little bit. Uh, but that's going to take a lot of faith on the, on the part of the skeptic, uh, the one that would be skeptical of our creator's existence here. That second law of thermodynamics, um, just to kind of, you know, pick the, pick the quote here, the entropy of the universe increases in all natural processes uh, isolated systems tend toward greater disorder. Essentially, we see that any closed system that exists is always going to move away from order and toward disorder or chaos. It doesn't work the other way around. And we can look at our own architecture and those kind of things. Look at the pyramids as they speculate existed once upon a time as compared to what it looks like now. Uh, the Colosseum and other things like that. They had an order that were put together by, uh, again, intelligent creators and the, and the sub-creators, I guess, in this case, of humanity. And look what happened to them over time. It just went toward uh, degradation and disorder and chaos we see in the end of that. A any thoughts on those illustrations before we continue on? I don't know if you're going to use this earlier or later, but the first law of thermodynamics is energy cannot be created or destroyed. Yeah. So and that's a law. So how, <laughs> yeah. how do they rectify energy being created when it can't be created? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Another other. Mind blowing, you know, kind of thing to think about and keep you up at night, kind of thought. Any other thoughts before we go on? So, I think sometimes um, you, you hear skeptics talking about the disorder and the chaos. Well, that just proves that, that God can't exist because why would He allow disorder and chaos? Because if everything's perfect, shouldn't everything be perfect? It remain perfect, yeah. Right, exactly. And so, that, that lends itself to having the discussion of, well, why is there disorder? Why is there chaos? Yeah. And, and what has caused that to not be a complete perfect paradise? And that coincides with uh, the account of sin entering the world. And you know, we live in a fallen world. <coughs> we experience some of that. But the fact that we are able to see the balance and perfection of, of how things work together so well, and I think that over overwhelmingly shows that there has to be uh, something. Good points. All right, continuing on. Uh, going to the divine nature of God, which is clearly perceived. And I want to approach this from uh, three different angles here. Um, I, don't think, I, I think I came up with this and then realized that this is an argument that I've already been made. So uh, I guess it, I, I, I was alerted by osmosis and it kind of came back out here as we look at it here. Uh, God is clearly perceived, or his nature is clearly perceived in the natural world. Uh, we've had some of these things mentioned, you know, the laws of nature, physics, for example, those thermodynamic laws, and those things there, complex systems, photosynthesis, uh, the water cycle, I'm going to pull on my fourth grade science uh, knowledge here and those kind of things, the ecosystems, the balance that, that was mentioned there, the weather systems, uh, climate, all those things there, complex systems indicate order, and uh, don't throw me out, uh, 1 Corinthians 14.33a, from specifically the NLT here, uh, different points being made, but I'm using this verse to make a, another point here. Uh, the specific word here is you, you or a phrase is used, God is not a God of disorder. You know, God is an organized being, and I think we see that in everything he creates, that order is being created and perpetuated. Uh, so again, different point being made in that verse, it's, it's slightly out of context, but I think the, the, the point does ring true that uh, God is a God of, of order, not a God of disorder here. I wish Dad was in here. He had a lot to say about this because this is something that, you know, growing up, we'd walk in the woods and hike and do those kind of things, go camping, and um, um, he would point out just every every little thing, acorns and the animals that we'd encounter, those kind of things, just points to the order and the intelligence behind it. You know, all these things point to a creator. Uh, speaking of which, organisms. Organisms would be another thing through which the nature of God is clearly perceived. We already talked about a little bit of the structure of the cell, how intricate it is, and again, going beyond that, the body systems and, and those things there interact, the biological processes, again, mentioning uh, photosynthesis, for example, uh, human, de human designs, they're far less complex than anything we see in nature, and in fact, in a lot of cases, everything we see in nature is kind of imitated by humanity, and sometimes it pales in comparison, we just watched a, a video in class uh, a couple of days ago, and they showed some amazing robots that people have made at different companies, and they struggle to do basic things like walk. 
and just the amount of energy and thought that goes into recreating something as simple as what we do each and every day is just uh, kind of mind blowing once again. Um, Psalm 139 14, I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, the marvelous are your works, and with that my soul knows very well. Uh, again, the idea that each one of us as individuals and all the things that we encounter in nature are created by a creator who has this complex way of thinking and makes things work and, and, and they perpetuate onward. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the balance of nature, this was mentioned several times as well. And this is where we're going to kind of go into the cosmic fine-tuning realm over here. We had a chance to look that term up and, and do a little research on that. Uh, life would not be possible if we're not for a variety of factors uh, being precisely tuned in our favor. So a verse here, Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, uh, kind of, I think, touches upon this. Uh, for as the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so my word that goes out from my mouth, uh, from my mouth, <coughs> it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Um, as we go into this cosmic fine tuning and we look at a couple of different examples of this, we see that there's a purpose behind it. We see that uh, God was involved in this process and but we're going to see that it's kind of inescapable of us, kind of that conclusion, I think, in some in some ways. Um, any, any thoughts before we continue on talking about cosmic fine tuning here? Well, I don't know if you had uh, found any examples in your own studies, but I'll give you a, a sampling here uh, of what I'm talking about. The idea of cosmic fine tuning is the suggestion, for, again, from again observing nature and different systems and those things. Our planet seems to have been engineered for the existence and perpetuation of life. You may be familiar with what's called the habitable zone. I prefer the term Goldilocks zone, as you'll see here in a second, because everything was just right, right? So if Earth's position in the solar system was a bit closer to the sun or a bit farther from the sun, uh, the conditions for life just wouldn't be a <coughs> problem. Uh, I've got a quote here. It says, a change in the Earth's location, just 2% in either direction, would result in worldwide extinction. If we were closer, it would be far too hot, the oceans might evaporate, life would exist obviously without water. If we were farther away, it would be far too cold, the oceans would freeze, life wouldn't exist. Uh, talking about, again, the habitable zone, the shape, or I guess the size of the sun, you know, as a star, it's the right size of star. Uh, the very larger or smaller, again, roasting or freezing would be a possibility there in this case. Going on, uh, Earth's proximity. Uh, it's just one of those factors that would have to occur for life to exist on our planet. Some scientists speculate that without Jupiter, uh, that gas giant uh, a little bit further out in our solar system, uh, without that planet being there, Earth would be at constant risk of being bombarded by meteors, uh, life-ending or extinction-level meteors that would happen here. So this gas giant, with this great amount of gravity being so big, acts as a sort of slingshot, and it catches these potentially devastating space rocks and gravitational pull and flings them back into... Uh, outer space from the inner solar system. Again, for protecting us from these disasters that could occur and allowing life on Earth to continue on. Um, another thing that's interesting is Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the composition of gases we know that make up the atmosphere is also just right. The atmosphere contains 21% of life-giving oxygen, but if we had 50% more, the air would be much more combustible. A single flash of lightning could ignite an entire forest fire just simultaneously. Uh, on the other hand, we have 10% less oxygen, we wouldn't even be able to start a fire. And so it's a, it's a neat uh, uh, conundrum here that we have just the right amount of oxygen here on, on Earth. So this is just a sampling of some of the different uh, examples of fine-tuning required for life on Earth to exist that scientists have discovered here. Any, any thoughts before we continue on with, with these thoughts? Here's, um, I'd also want to, what, what's incredible is, you know, we, we mentioned all these things we are today, and on today. All those things have taken so many years of time to come about. They're still not very intricate in comparison to yeah. anything you're, you're mentioning here. And God did it instantly. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the, ins the, the instantaneous yeah. complexity of what was created in this, I don't know, I mean, everybody and everybody says, but I, I know I'm guilty of not for sure putting that in perspective. Yeah. When I think about how awesome God is, it's not it's not just how incredible and perfect everything is, but how it's how it's basically done at just the, the voice of Him. Just it, it just it just came it's just speaking it, and it just it just happens. It's incredible to think about yeah. God and, and that He works. So again.
again, just a sampling of some of this cosmic fine tuning. We could probably spend a great deal more time talking about some of these uh, some of these different um, things that would have to occur for life to exist on planet Earth. But I found this is an interesting quote in my studies here: the probability of life sustained planet occurring naturally and through this happenstance that so many think would be uh, the case here. The probability of life sustained planet such as Earth occurring naturally, with all those correct parameters existing, is one in the 10 to the 30th power, that or one in what's called a quintillion here in this case. So I hope I got quintillion right there on, on the board. You kind of lose track of the zeros there after a certain point. So putting all this together, talking about it from a, um, you know, the, the ratio perspective and those kind of things, it would seem here on Earth that we would hit what scientists call the cosmic jackpot, as Paul Davies would say. Uh, there's this former agnostic, uh, agnostic physicist that Paul Davies was talking about who made the following quote, through my scientific work, I've come to believe more and more strongly that the physical universe is put together with an ingenuity so astonishing that I cannot accept it as merely brute fact. Similarly, this other guy, Fred Boyle, remarks, a common sense interpretation of the facts that a super intellect uh, has monkeyed with physics. And another guy, Robert Jastrow, uh, the head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, has called this the most powerful existence for, powerful evidence, excuse me, for the existence of God ever to come out of science. So as we see more and more of this, more and more evidence for cosmic fine tuning revealed by modern science, it's increasingly difficult for scientists and honest scientists to believe that these conditions would occur by random happenstance. There's this guy, uh, Dr. Frank Turek, and he was called, this is the title of his book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, because you have to believe all these things happen and occur naturally uh, on their own there. And of course, we're familiar with the verse, uh, Psalm 14.1a, uh, which says, the fool in his heart says there is no God. Any other thoughts before we continue on and hopefully start to get into a few of the uh, uh, invisible attributes here? Yeah. There'll be a lot of those who uh, lean upon this idea that for you to believe that there is an invisible God that's somehow out there but not out there, and you, you just you have to be foolish <coughs> to believe that. And that's, that's a very common uh, criticism of Christians. Stupid! You're ignorant. They, they just don't have the intelligence or the world has. Um, and there's a there's an abundance of evidence that that is not the case among some of the most intellectual minds on the earth. There's a, a website that escapes me now. They just keep a, a running tally, kind of its whole purpose. I think of this page: scientists who believe not in God but in creation. So scientists who believe in, in uh, that this this must have happened through some sort of intelligent design, whether or not we know it's God or if it's the God of the Bible, or you know that that's not the purpose of their of their study in that at that point. Just that this happened by accident is frankly impossible. Any other thoughts? I mean, as has been said, when we start with a completely materialistic idea, and that's we don't leave any room for the supernatural. Um, I mean, we kind of pigeonhole ourselves. As mentioned. We have to come up with some way to explain all the evidence that's there. Uh, you know, random chance uh, has, you know, obviously life exists the way it does now. So that means that, uh, we, well, we did hit the jackpot. And, and you know, this is, this is where we are. But uh, as we've been talking about, just reasoning through that and, and just thinking through what is the evidence. And, you know, what, what would we expect uh, if, if, our, if our view of God is, is correct? And he is all-powerful, all-knowing, but he also preserves our free will and gives us the ability to choose. Uh, you know, some people are like, well, if, if God was, was real, then he would give us extraordinary evidence that we could not not believe. Yeah. Uh, could not, yeah. you know what I mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it's, that's not how God works, because if he did, if he forced us to, to believe, that would not be and that, that wouldn't be something that, uh, that we're actually reasoning through. And so he wants us to be reasonable people. And, and again, I, I think we could take it too far the other way. And just, just I, I don't want to blind myself to anything that's out there. Uh, you know, we need, we need to be aware of this. We need to be able to have those conversations uh, with people not be scared. So. Any other thoughts? Before you continue on? Well, we know that uh, a lot of uh, scientists, atheists, uh, will use time as their evidence. Given enough time, anything can happen. Just keep That's why 
time is very important in geology and, of course, in the life sciences because they need all this time for things to progress. Um, but just like Ron said, I mean, God just spoke it. <laughs> he didn't need a lot of time because he's beyond time. He's outside time. Um, and so he just spoke it and it just happened. You don't, in God's case, you don't need a long, a long period of time. The thing with the age of the earth just keeps getting older and older and the universe just keeps getting older and older. So he said to allow for this kind of thing to happen randomly. Uh, continuing on. So a couple of invisible attributes. Uh, I think we kind of touched upon this one over and over again. Uh, his eternal power. Uh, and we see that there also his divine nature and his, his ways that he works and those things there. Uh, but two, two thoughts, uh, just again, kind of threw them in here, are almighty and benevolent God. Uh, Psalm 8, 3 through 4 uh, says, Whenever we look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Uh, thankfully, we find our God is a benevolent God, and he's one that will, will care for us. And so in this grand scheme of the universe and everything that exists uh, beyond us, uh, God is mindful of us and cares for us. Can I get someone to read uh, James 1.17 for us, please? Whoever gets there would be, would be great. So we get there first. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. All right, and likewise, if someone doesn't care to read Psalm 8, 5-6. <coughs> We have made him a little lower than the angels, and have crowned him with glory and honor. We have made him to have dominion over the works of his hands. We have put all things under his feet. So it's interesting. We're going to talk about this more when we talk about the nature of man in one of our upcoming uh, lessons as well. Uh, just the favorite position we have as uh, God's, I guess, central focal point of, of creation there. And again, all these things, these things, like he does not want to perpetuate, but they perpetuate, and they, they exist and, and serve us in, in ways that allow us to survive and flourish as well. So, moving on to the last part of that verse we used as our framework here, uh, looking over here, in what ways would mankind be without excuse according to the divine judgment of God? So we talked a lot about different evidences and different ways that... Um, Prove the existence of God, I think we could say, and make that bold claim there. Um, how would that make mankind without excuse in response to things like this? Well, you know, it's pretty much uh, Psalm 14. In the face of such overwhelming evidence, to say that there's no, that, that it's accidentally, random uh, that's just declaring yourself completely void of it I mean how can intelligent an intelligent human you know, like you had with, with the junkyard and the tornado wow that's how we get an airplane <coughs> that, 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 that's, that's declaring yourself this is what a fool does you know? so the, the three things that I came up with is the failure to acknowledge God Failure to glorify him and failure to worship him. That's kind of what it touches on here in all these things. It's just we need to do all of them. Absolutely. Uh, no. the, God is communicating even when he doesn't communicate. I mean, there's, <clears throat> there's still, just by the what, things that we have seen, very obviously, information put into our world that we are able to interpret, we're able to, to see and make sound conclusions from. We, if we leave the house and leave the boys at home uh, and we come back to a house that's just in chaos and destroyed, their argument, well, we didn't think you were ever coming back or we didn't think you cared if, you know, all the pots and pans were now out in the front yard would, would go, would be a very foolish thing for them to say. We have, we have communicated, even we never said, don't do that. We never said we're, we're coming back. We've communicated through our lives with them that this is information you can know about us. And the same way in Romans 1, there's things we can know about God. What it is that he wants his will for us, and there's things that are outside of that knowledge, but we cannot, we cannot say that we have no evidence that, yeah, that you, you did it exist. Yeah. So, a 
According to the Bible, in this section of verses, Romans 1, 18 through 25, if you want to really again, please point to me brought up in that section of Scripture. According to the Bible, God's revealed himself to mankind. Uh, and consider that mankind through the ages, across continents and countless diverse cultures, there's always been a belief in a higher power. Now, this belief in a higher power may have been misguided and done other things there along the way, studying or worshiping other kind of things that we see rather than the true God. But we see, I think, that the need to worship is apparently ingrained into us. And as we said already, unfortunately, this need, coupled with mankind's free will and sinful nature, has historically led to false worship. Uh, Romans 1, 21-25, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him nor give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And get into some stuff, I'm not going to preach in the pulpit or anything like that, but I wondered at one time, if with Adam and Eve, with, with Noah later on, there wasn't a unified religion that people understood and knew God, of course, they were raised by these godly people. And then over time, we see this de-evolution, if you will, as we get away from God. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to lust their hearts to impurity, disarming of their bodies among themselves, that they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship to serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And that's another point that comes up that I've heard others make in many cases, is in denying a creator, uh, in a lot of ways, you elevate yourself to that point, that you, uh, there is no higher power than mankind or myself, and those kind of things, you kind of elevate yourself to a godlike level, claiming you have that knowledge. Uh, another, another verse to consider here, and I hope I've got the right one, actually, I think I have the wrong verse, <coughs> I think this is in um, Second Peter, yeah, I got the wrong one up there, Second Peter 3. Uh, 3 through 12. I'll read this real quickly before that last bell rings. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing upon their own sinful desires. They will say, Where's the promise of his coming? I'll kind of touch upon this here. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, things are continuing as they have from the beginning of creation. So they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And by that means, of these, what the world existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth now exist are stored for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction and godly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to reach repentance. And see, again, God's benevolence and mercy here. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief, and when the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up. And dissolve, and the work, earth and its works that are done within will be exposed. Since all these things are thus dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening for the coming day of the Lord, because of which the heavens which be set on fire and dissolve, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Uh, our God can create, and he can also destroy his creation and his power over that. So, quick summary uh, of the points that we've discussed here, which... I've got bonus content. If you want to copy this PowerPoint and get to at some point, stuff we didn't get to. I was kind of worried about how the pace of this class would go, and it seems like we kind of nailed the timeline, but at least it seems that way. Uh, so if that's some extra stuff you are interested in, you can, you can get with me, and I'll get that to you. Uh, but God's invisible attributes, they are cre clearly revealed through creation. We see that God is eternal, supremely intelligent, all-powerful being. He's responsible for all existence, and yet we know he's personal and benevolent toward us. That theological argument affirms that God exists because creation necessitates creator. The idea of cosmic fine-tuning further indicates the existence of God because of the favorable conditions of the world in which we exist. And finally, mankind is without excuse according to God's divine judgment. God has revealed himself through creation. Thank you all. If you need materials, we've still got some for upcoming sessions. Um, but thank you all for your attention and comments. <coughs>